Anyway, um, we're glad you all are here. And we have Melinda Merrill with us today, who is with the South Carolina Office of Rural Health. And she is going to talk to us all about uh, a great project, the Rural Health Action Plan, uh, which I was fortunate to be involved in late, better late than never, but I, it was a wonderful experience and I'm really excited about it. Um, and this was really very much a community engagement project that included assessment, uh, community assessment factors. And um, so here's a real life example and an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, that take, about things that take place uh, outside an academic world or the academic models of everything. So um, I'm going to go ahead and we can go ahead and get started uh, here. So welcome, Melinda. I'm putting your slides up here. So have you? That's moving them, right? We're, we're good there. Yep. OK. Great. Well, um, thanks so much. I want to thank first um, Kelly and Janet for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. This is a, a project that I've been working on for about the past year, and it's um, been a very um, exciting process because of the sheer just um, number of stakeholders and the sort of different approach that it's taken um, my office in um, and in our state in uh, is the hope. So um, I'm going to just try to give a brief overview of both kind of the overall plan and the process that we've used to develop that and then talk a little bit more specifically about some of the community engagement work that we did because that was something that was very critical to um, the plans development as well as something that um, we felt very strongly about in terms of creating this sort of a, an action plan for the state. So, um, so I'll um, start with just a little bit of information about our office and what we do. So the South Carolina Office of Rural Health, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We've been in existence for about 26 years, and um, we are actually one of 50 state offices of rural health throughout the nation. So uh, we're uh, very fortunate to receive some core funding from the Federal Office of State, um, excuse me, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, which is in the um, Federal Department of Health and Human Services under the Health Resources and Services Administration. So um, a, a little bit of, of history, there's probably not too many um, rural health geeks in the audience other than maybe Jana and Kelly. Um, <laughs> but we we had a lot of um, changes in the rural health care delivery system in the 1980s in our country because of the way um, Medicare payment was being structured to hospitals and, and there was a lot of um, a lot of things that were happening that caused a lot of disruption in the rural health care delivery system in the 80s. And so um, sort of towards the end of the 80s, early 90s, they established the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at the federal level, and then um, subsequently state offices to help um, be a place of connection for rural health care providers and rural, health, rural communities to ensure that there was access to health care. So, so our bread and butter is working with rural health care providers every day. I just came back this afternoon from a meeting at the hospital in Dillon County. Um, working with providers there on some community engagement issues that they're um, working towards right now. So we um, we have a staff of about 40 between um, our office. That's primarily um, our, our main office is located in Lexington. We also have an office in Orangeburg that um, has a maternal and child health focused program. So we have about 40 folks. Um, we're actually unique in South Carolina too, and I'll mention this because it's a little bit of the context that we're in, but we're a nonprofit, as I stated, that's unusual for a state office of rural health. Um, we're one of three in the nation that is, Colorado and Michigan are the other two that are. Um, I mentioned that because most of our colleagues are in state health departments, so they're in a DHEC setting, um, and at one point we were in a DHEC setting, but, um, but came out of that early on in our history. Um, and that, of course, really makes a difference in terms of how and when and who you can engage and, and how that process works um, in terms of working with communities. So, um, so I think we're very fortunate in South Carolina um, in terms of rural health um, work to be able to, to have that um, flexibility in the work that we do. So, so that's a little bit of overview about our office, and then I'll um, sort of start talking a little bit about um, the, the context for today. So. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, we often talk about, and hopefully some of you are aware of, there's, um, 
you know, we have health disparities among various populations within the U.S. And one of those disparities is actually geographic. We know that rural communities are typically, um, of course, they're typically older, but they're often um, sicker and often um, more impoverished than urban communities. And so that's something that we pay very close attention to as sort of the rural health experts in the state. Um, and we try to think about, you know, how we can uh, decrease those disparities. So one of the things that we've thought a lot about are um, recently are how those um, disparities may be related to the social determinants of health and how rural communities have access to not just healthcare services, but education and employment opportunities and, and those types of things. And so, and as you can see there in that chart, some of you probably are familiar with the work that County Health Rankings has done through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, they've really sh helped to shine a light on the fact that, um, you know, what determines our health is not necessarily our access to healthcare services. That's certainly a piece of it. But a lot of it is related to our behaviors. Um, it's related to the environment in which we live and, and things that um, contribute to those. So, um, so one of the things that we um, are doing um, as an office and one, one of the things that, as Janet mentioned, we engage people in is to have this broader conversation. So if we really were going to be serious about improving rural health outcomes in our state, how would we do that? And one of the things that we um, we decided was a necessary step was to develop a rural health action plan for the state. So why did we think this was one of the appropriate steps to take? Well, we actually have a federal grant requirement that um, we, we receive a little bit of funding to help um, small rural hospitals in our state with quality and operational improvement strategies. And part of that grant requires us to create a state rural health plan. Now, um, for the, the three years that are listed there, we essentially, um, I think the first year, I was not around then, but the first year they did it, they sort of did a very intensive process and um, tried to get as much input and feedback as possible. And then that sort of went to um, the federal grantors and it sat on a shelf and nobody really <laughs> used it. So as you can imagine, in subsequent years, there was uh, not as much effort put into it. However, we had um, our neighbors to the north in North Carolina in 2014 went through a process where they really did this other, um, they did this look um, more broadly to include some of these other sectors and stakeholders and some of that has to do with the politics and the, the scene um, there in North Carolina. Um, but they really led the way and, and, and set a um, sort of a path for other states to follow to look at rural health in a broader context. And so we had, um, we worked very closely with our colleagues in North Carolina and had um, seen what they had done and really were, were very impressed by it and thought that this would be a good approach for us to, to use as well. So, and again, there you see that part of the issue is, of course, that we're, we live comparatively in a very unhealthy state. Um, the Southeast tends to be, um, as a whole, poorer and sicker and, um, you know, has uh, worse health outcomes than the rest of the nation. And so part of what we saw is that um, if we could work better together and coordinate our investments, um, particularly in rural areas, that this would be um, a good step to take to, um, to mitigate some of these issues. So, um, so again, this was sort of what led us to bring all of these various stakeholders together to create this plan. And once again, this sort of repeats itself, but um, you know, to look at more than just access to healthcare, but really what are those um, global contributors to health outcomes. So one of the first things we did is um, we developed a steering committee and we had um, a nine member steering committee of um, kind of an equal mix of people from rural communities as well as state leaders and people interested in rural health um, and rural health experts. We had some um, academic involvements. Um, Dr. Jane Pritz from the Arnold School was on that steering committee, um, as well as, uh, again, a few other stakeholders. They really helped us to, to define um, what we wanted to do here. And again, we had that North Carolina, North Carolina plan process as a way to kind of guide us. And we took a look at what they did and then developed a, a course for how we would do this in South Carolina. So these were sort of the principles that we used to guide the work throughout the last year. And again, the Kind of overarching goal was to develop this comprehensive framework or plan that would have actionable strategies 
we really wanted to time limit it. So we said the next three to five years, and again, the purpose being there to have a shared vision um, for the state. We really felt like this would be important um, for the communities as well, for them to have better information and better understanding of the things that happen at the state level so that they can better take, take advantage of those opportunities. And then um, by putting this in such a public forum as we've done, um, it really kind of shines a light and, and really promotes shared accountability among not only us as um, state leaders in rural health, but among communities, among our um, legislators, among funders, um, everyone that's really invested and involved and interested in rural health that helps to really um, put that at the forefront of everyone's attention and really make sure everybody's doing their, their equal part to make change happen. So this is um, the, this slide I'm going to click through a few times that has sort of our, our model and our approach in it. So one of the things is that we chose a theoretical framework to sort of somewhat guide the work that we did and we chose the socio-ecological model of health. This seemed like it, it made sense to us because it included not only the health services um, that we knew would be important, but also again those community environmental factors as well as health behaviors. This is also the model that North Carolina used, so we, we shamelessly stole that from them as well. Then we had sort of these other, um, oh no, so some of my circles didn't show up here. Um, okay, well, so imagine, if you will, that there are three <laughs> circles in the middle of this uh, dotted circle line that um, have three parts to them. So we sort of had three different areas of um, um, kind of congruence, I guess, if you will, that were contributors to developing this plan. So we had an expert task force, which I'll talk about more in just a second. And then we had a, um, a lot of epidemiological data that we gathered and that we used to inform the process. And then we also, as I mentioned, had community engagement. So I'm going to talk about each of those sort of separately as we go forward. So this slide represents the, um, the different members of the task force and we had, um, all told, about 50 or so members that came to monthly meetings for about um, uh, nine months and were really tasked with kind of helping uh, work together with our staff to develop some of these recommendations that you um, that we'll talk about more in a minute. But really what those, um, those task force members were in the beginning were stakeholders. So we went through a, a long process as staff to really think through, okay, first of all, who are the you know, relevant state level um, leaders that we need to engage? Who are the people that we know at the local level are invested and interested in this and would be able to contribute both time and ideas to this process? Um, and then we went through a process of inviting all of these, these various people. So we had, um, and I'm, uh, my, my staff hate this, but I'm a very visual person. So I had like endless charts and tables comparing and contrasting um, you know, we matched everybody by, um, and, and we literally did this, we matched everybody by the region of the state that they were from to make sure we had equal distribution of parts of the state. We matched rural versus urban um, in terms of where people lived and where they worked. We also um, looked at the gender and the racial and ethnic makeup of our group to ensure that we had good diversity among our partners. So we really worked very hard at trying to make this a very inclusive and diverse group of rural health experts and rural health um, stakeholders. So when we did all that, we sort of came up with this list of different, and these are the organizations, obviously, that the individuals represented. And we, um, the process that we did to basically invite them is we drafted a um, letter of, um, you know, kind of outlining both what we were trying to do in those guiding principles and then what the commitment would be of the partners. And we asked them in the beginning to only commit to eight meetings, um, which were four hours in length. And many of these people had to travel to Columbia for the meeting. So really a whole day, we asked them to commit once a month for um, a total of eight meetings. We took December off. Um, so it was nine months total of time. But um, we, we out laid that at the beginning and said, this is exactly what we're going to ask you to do, no more, no less. And um, then we mailed, hard copy mailed those letters out to people. And that doesn't happen a lot <laughs> anymore. So we really wanted to make sure people saw it, read it, they held it in their hands, they knew how important this was. 
and um, and then asked them to respond to us if they were willing to participate. And we invited, again, about 50 folks. We only had um, two organizations decline to participate, um, and which is a, yeah, so Kelly's in the background saying, wow, that it is really a great response rate to the process. And I think part of that is because we were very intentional about it. And I think the two that did decline, both of those were both time commitment issues. So they were people that said, you know, this sounds wonderful. We really want to participate, but we just really are short staffed right now. We just don't have the time to contribute. And so they, um, they both of those organizations, we engaged at various points through the process going forward. But, um, but anyway, that was, you know, the task force was a big part of um, kind of bringing all the information together that we had and really helping to, um, to, boil that down into to the recommendations at the end. So they were very important stakeholders to us. So this is a little bit about the timeline again. In August, the task force met for the first time. They met through April. We had um, community engagement throughout that time. We released the initial recommendations on May 3rd. And I believe, Janet, that's the, yes. the uh, handout that was provided to the students is the back. The cover looks like this. Yeah. So, um, so you've got that. Yeah, great. So you've got that kind of list of recommendations and that um, booklet that we put together. Um, we're really in the process, not to skip too much ahead, but we're really in the process now of engaging more stakeholders because we have to now um, take the recommendations that were created by the task force and put the action steps behind them. And I think one of the nice things is because we had so many diverse groups involved, we realized a lot of this work is ongoing in the state and we want to make sure that we're um, again being inclusive of the partners that are already doing this work that are already you know um, striving to to get to these these endpoints how can we enhance um, what they're doing already how can we align efforts from disparate stakeholders and try to make that a, a stronger effort across the state so we're in that process right now i'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the in a minute but um trying to basically finish up by November with a full um, release of the full plan. So I didn't want to skip this part um, because this was a very important issue um, early on in that, um, in the task force meetings especially. So, um, so I think at the very first meeting actually of the task force, we, we um, and of the steering committee too, as I recall, we, we had to kind of grapple with this issue of what is rural and um, you all may not know this, but at the federal level, there's something like 80 some odd definitions of, of rural community. Um, and those are all based on various regulatory requirements, grant program requirements, you name it, everybody creates their own definition. And, and people are hesitant for good reason to, I think, really put a hard and fast definition on what is rural. For one thing, it changes. When we have the census every 10 years, they update the um, rural designations. And because there is so much, um, Kind of monetarily tied to rural designations. There's a lot of advocacy um, from not just healthcare providers and the healthcare community, but from various other um, interests as well. The farm, farming community, obviously agriculture, that's a huge, you know, how rural is defined is hugely important to them. So, um, so it can be a very um, sensitive topic. Um, and usually if I talk to groups in the state, I very generally say, if you think you're rural, you probably are. <laughs> um, and that, you know, seems to satisfy most folks, but it's, it's true because I think, you know, depending on where you sit and, um, and, and what you're doing, there are ways that you can, you can usually qualify, um, which, which is a little bit strange, but it's true. Um, so we really had to grapple with this and say, okay, if we're going to, especially if we're going to look at epi data as a state, we need to really have a concise definition of what we think rural is and how we're going to use it to define this plan. So we, we came to the consensus that we would use these rural urban commuting area codes. So we call them RUCAs for short. Um, and this really uses, um, there's a little bit here about the methodology behind RUCAs if you care about that. Um, but it really uses census tract level data um, to define not only population density, but it takes into account commuting patterns of, of individuals. So um, it, it identifies the, the um, commuting time and, and where people are commuting to you to really help pinpoint rural areas. It's one of the better definitions of rural and it's the one that um, our federal counterparts use most often in the federal office of rural policy. So when we did that, we um, were able to identify um, 
most of the state, as you can see, is rural. They're in the teal color. So um, the areas that, that fall out are in the very metropolitan areas, Greenville, Columbia, Charleston. Um, you also see that the beach, Myrtle Beach area is um, urban. Um, a little bit of Florence area is urban down around Hilton Head, Beaufort County there, Janet's pointing to. The Augusta area creeps in there into Aiken County and then Charlotte from the north in New York County. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Everything else is fairly well rural. And this was something that was really important when we got to the community engagement piece too, because as you can see, there are a lot of places there that are the full county is considered rural. And so that's kind of a no brainer. You can, you can pretty well go anywhere in the county and that's a, a rural area. But we, um, we really made a point of looking at these these areas of urban counties, um, you know, Charleston, Richland, um, Greenville, places where that's a typical urban population, but you do have pockets of very, you know, very rural areas. We made a point of engaging a lot of those communities into the discussion as well when we um, when we engage them in this process. And I, you know, one of the more memorable listening sessions that we had was in the little town of St. Stephen um, in Berkeley County. We visited the elementary school there and it was just, um, I work a lot in very small, very rural um, counties in our state, but to go from the very lushness of and, and resourceful uh, area of Monk's Corner and you drive 10 minutes more and then you're in a town that, that really resembles a very, very rural place in our state was just um, a little bit of a, um, uh, it kind of, you know, disrupted my mind a little bit about how that, you know, how that can be. And that community was really helpful in, in terms of, you know, how, what rural meant to them and how, how they might engage in a process like this. So, um, so this was important and it was a very important process to, um, for the stakeholders to build consensus in. And it's really going to be an important part of um, when we get to the implementation of the plan, how we, how that looks and who we engage in that. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. We had a, um, a wonderful um, PhD student in EPI, uh, Kathy Odahowski, who worked with us to do all of the fabulous data. And if she were doing this presentation, she could show you like a thousand maps that all look fantastic. I'm not a um, I'm not a strong EPI person, so it would it would not be useful of my time or yours for me to try to do that. Um, but we did do a lot to look at. Um, what, what were issues in South Carolina from a strictly quantitative standpoint. Um, and we use a lot of different sources to do that. So these are listed here, they're pretty common ones, but you know, we use the census for definitional purposes to look at the demographics of communities. Um, we used, you know, kind of, again, the kind of regular Joe kind of, you know, run of the mill type of public health data sources that you would, you would think of. This one policy map, the third bullet there, is a really interesting one that um, we actually purchase access to and it really goes through and it will take a county and it can basically pool a lot of various data sources nationally and give you a really good picture from an economic standpoint of what communities look like. Um, so that was one that we thought was really useful and then um, use a lot of different data from, again, um, our experts on the task force and in the communities. So these were some of the outcomes that Cassie found when she um, um, analyzed all of the data that she gathered. So um, some of the things that are good about rural South Carolina in comparison to urban South Carolina, um, that was our kind of um, the comparison that we made throughout the, the analysis. But um, we saw that high school graduation graduation rates were at least as good as, as if not better in rural South Carolina, which is um, really a testament to a lot of the work that's been happening over the past probably 15 or 20 years in our state. Um, home ownership levels are actually higher in rural South Carolina. And this, this has an asterisk beside it because this was a big point of contention with our task force. Um, they were able to inform us that yes, home ownership levels are indeed higher, but that's because there's a high number of mobile homes in South Carolina and that that's the contributing factor to that data. So on the surface, that looks like it's something that would be important and it's very, um, it's very good, but actually there's, there's context there that needs to be considered. We have low okay, rates of, sure. So when, if that's the thing, so is it that they don't own the property that the mobile home is on? Like how do you, mm -hmm. like how would you parse that out? Mm -hmm. That's what it is, they own the mobile home, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the property that it's on. Sometimes they do own the property right. as well. Um, I think what 
becomes a, a bigger issue for for many people is that um, the inefficiency of that home type is that they pay a lot then in utility bills. You know, there's yeah. all kinds of yeah. additional costs right. and upkeep okay. and okay. and and oftentimes they're um, a lot of these mobile homes are very old and so um, yeah. so they may own them and yeah. they may be paid for. Right. But they're in very poor condition, yeah. and the quality of them is not not so good. So well, and they decrease in value. That's right. Yeah, I live in they rural Richland, right. so I live in rural. So exactly, yeah. you do. You're on yeah, that map. So I'm, <laughs> I'm in rural, um, and yes, I mean, so um, and then they don't necessarily tie to the property, and so there's lots of issues. Okay, well, I just want I'm just was no. wondering about that because I, I when I was flipping through, I saw that, and I was like, wow. But that's why you have stakeholders involved. That's right. Because that's not really a wow. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yep. Um, and it, and it is important when we get to the housing recommendations. I mean, that was a big um, a, a big point of you know this is something we need to address. You know, it, it, on the surface, it, again, it looks like a good thing, but it's it's actually a, a big contributor to poor health outcomes. So, um, so we also um, in rural South Carolina have low rates of excessive drinking, um, though that's a um, kind of a um, high point and a lot of other poor outcomes in terms of substance use. So, um, And then social associations, which is an index that um, Cassie used, um, are higher in uh, rural areas and urban counties, and that's something that we would, of course, expect just um, based on the fact that rural communities are typically smaller, more close-knit, have a lot of um, structure in terms of their their social ties in the community. Of course, you as you would expect, there are a lot of opportunities um, that we, you know, were, were very high on the list that, that we could look at to address. Um, and, and you'll notice when we get to the recommendations, not all of these were, um, uh, were addressed in the recommendations. And of course, part of that's because you have the context of the stakeholders giving you feedback on, you know, you know, a you know, quanti you know, from a quantitative standpoint, this looks like an opportunity or an issue that needs to be addressed. But you know, is it actually? You know, is it is that happening? Um, you know, we have a an issue in rural, and that small numbers kind of inflate some of these issues sometimes. Meaning that, um, you know, when you compare it to other places, then um, it maybe looks like a, a bigger problem than it is. And I don't mean to insinuate that that's the case in any of these because I don't have the data in front of me. But um, I think that's something that the stakeholders can help, again, provide context around. And they did. And then the other thing is, what is the, you know, what is the policy situation with, um, with these issues? You know, some of these things are not, um, people don't necessarily want to um, talk openly about them, much less address them through policy means. And so, um, you know, that's a big, a big thing that, you know, or maybe there are no resources available. Maybe we've, we've already tapped out all of the resources. When I look at, you know, shortage of providers, that's an ongoing problem for rural communities. We've had that problem in our country for 40 or 50 years, and we have lots of federal programs to address that. Yet, we're always going to have a problem. Um, well, I shouldn't say always, but, you know, pretty much we're always going to have a problem with shortage of providers because it's just difficult to recruit professionals to want to live in rural areas. Um, you know, part of what I think those those last three bullets there, um, low college, educational attainment, children in poverty, single parent homes, you know, those types of issues, I think, really were what resonated a lot more with, um, with the task force, partially because those sort of contribute um, in total to all of the kind of um, problems and issues that we see and opportunities that there are. So, um, so we really spent a lot of time talking about, about those things. So that's sort of, again, a brief overview of how we used um, EPI data in the, in the process. And then I want to talk a little bit about the community listening sessions that we did and, and how we engaged community. And um, I was actually sharing with Kelly um, just a minute ago that I, I took a social work class in the spring this year with um, Dr. Kirk Foster, who's a great um, expert in social capital and in community. And he taught us um, all about community-engaged research. So that was a great um, counterpart to the work that I was doing um, in in the field um, I was getting some academic um, uh, information about it as well and so I think you know these are a couple definitions that 
I didn't necessarily use for this work, but I think they're pretty good definitions of things you want to think about when you think about community. We define community from a geographic standpoint for this process. And part of that was because, again, I just sort of went through the definition of rural and how for, for rural health, that's an important context. That's an important um, indicator that we really wanted to focus on was the was the geographic boundaries. But there's all kinds of different ways that you can define community. And as you do community engagement, to me, that's the first step. You need to think about who that community is and who the stakeholders are. And you have to almost have the boundaries around it so that you know exactly what you're looking at so that you can um, um, you can you can know what you're assessing and who you need to engage and so so I think that's just you know that's a, a point I didn't want to miss in this discussion was how to define the community um, so again we sort of define them in a geographic way and we actually took a two-phased approach for um, gathering community input part of the reason for this was that um, we got a little bit, uh, uh, this is a little inside baseball, but we got a little ahead of ourselves in the development of this plan, and this happens sometimes. So we knew we wanted community engagement. We knew we wanted community input. So we said, we're going to have these community listening sessions, and they're going to be uh, roughly this fall. That sounds good. You know, this was like sort of last June, and we didn't really um, have everything um, very well mapped out at that point. And so when we got to sort of planning the first task force meetings, we realized that part of what we needed to do with the task force was give them time to, you know, meet each other, learn about each other, think through the, the topics that we were proposing, study that EPI data. And we didn't really have anything to take to the communities at that point. And so one of the things that Cassie and I worked on was to say, well, we've got some of this quant quantitative data that, you know, we, we really could use some help um, um, you know, how we really could use some context for some of these things because, again, you've got because you've got such a wide diversity of uh, rural communities, some being close to urban areas, some being on the coast, some being in the mountains. You know, South Carolina has a lot of, um, I've said it 12 times now, diversity in its rural communities. And so we thought, well, one of the things we could do is really just go to the communities and talk to some of the leaders one on one. Why don't we do that and sort of get some initial community feedback? Then once we get a little further into this process, we have something that we can actually take out to the communities. We can do a bigger kind of community engagement um, process. And that's indeed what we did. So um, so the first part there in um, uh, last December, um, we did 16 community stakeholder interviews with community leaders. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail. And then um, just this past March, we went out and did big events with communities and um, did some town hall groups where we talked to various leaders and people in the community. We did some smaller focus groups with church groups and Relay for Life groups and other civic groups and, um, you know, anybody that we could find that would talk to us, we <laughs> really went and talked to. And then we actually did some surveys as well because we, we really wanted to try to, again, reach as many people as possible. and. We did those both online um, through um, kind of a survey monkey and then used Facebook to target different groups with that, as well as provided um, some paper hard copy surveys to our DHEC clinics in rural counties throughout the state to um, engage those, um, those clients as well. So really had a lot of different avenues that we were trying to reach community. And again, this was very intentional. We really felt like it would not make sense to create a state rural health action plan and not have the input of rural communities um, threaded throughout that process because um, as you all probably well know it would make no sense for us in Columbia to develop this great plan and then take out the communities and say doesn't this look great aren't you all excited about this don't you want to do these things and you know naturally um, the human condition is that uh, they would they would probably say no this is terrible why didn't you ask us what we needed and you know those sorts of things so so we really, again, were very intentional about that process. Um, and then I just note here that we were also just, you know, kind of throughout throughout gathering the community input, we were also gathering input for other stakeholders and kind of trying to, again, continuously, this was sort of a long process of like a continuous environmental scan. We were constantly thinking about who the other stakeholders should be, who was missing and, and who we should include. And so, so Janet kind of said there at the beginning that, you know, she kind of came in a little bit later in the process. Well, that's because we didn't know about Janet until a little bit later in the process. And so when we met her, um, which was sort of uh, kind of by accident, 
you know, she was a natural fit to be included in the task force. And so, you know, again, sort of just continuously trying to be inclusive and trying to, to um, engage engage these stakeholders. So at some point we need to make this map um, overlay with the rural areas, but um, that you'll have to trust me that this is um, a, a large segment of the community. Um, and in fact, this doesn't have where we did DHEC surveys. So a lot of the rural communities um, in Greenwood County is missing its name there. Um, I'll have to get this map fixed. But um, the rural communities that you know, I'm pointing out a few of them here, Abbeville, Barnwell, Hampton, Chesterfield, like a lot of those we did DHEC um, client surveys in those counties. So we had some coverage of, of people from those um, areas. But in terms of where we did um, the interviews and then where we went back and did listing sessions, we purposely did, um, I'll, I'll point this out because I think it's important. We did, um, so Orangeburg, for example, we did some interviews there um, with community leaders and then we also instead of going to a completely different place every time we also went back and did listening sessions there because we wanted to compare what we were hearing from individual leaders versus what we heard in group settings um, and and that was an important thing to kind of help provide some context again at the local level but we did try to outreach to as many different rural communities as we could and that's what this map is intended to demonstrate so um, again, sort of this first process of collecting information from community leaders. Um, this is a little bit from the literature about how, um, um, essentially how little there is about, um, how, um, how little there is in the literature, I, I should say, about how important engaging communities are in um, addressing the social determinants of health. And particularly when you talk about community engagement in rural populations. Um, it's something that, as I learned very quickly through this process, takes a long time. So um, it's, you know, not only the outreach to the communities and, and doing the actual work, but then analyzing that and, and turning that into um, an academic pub publication takes quite a long time. And so there's really not much in the literature about this, um, about this topic. And so there wasn't a lot to build on, um, but we did build on some, some of the literature about just community engagement in general and how we might um, use that to, to approach the community leaders. Um, and again, we were trying to provide context and kind of um, place some of the quantitative data that we're collecting. And so part of what we wanted to do, first of all, was to say, um, well, how, how do communities conceptualize health? So I started out this presentation by talking about how um, Health is health outcomes are are much more than just do you have access to healthcare services. They are you know all of the other things in our environment. But you know is that a belief that's held by rural communities or is that knowledge that rural communities have and rural leaders have? Um, so that was one of the things that we wanted to help um, that we wanted to find out the answer to to help us shape those um, shape the the data again that Cassie was collecting. And then the second question that we wanted to figure out was, okay, we have a lot of different resources and, and lots of different activities kind of happening in rural communities. Is there is there a difference between communities in terms of the organization of that? You know, does that influence health and does that have an, an impact on, um, on health outcomes? So we use that to develop, develop a, um, a um, semi-structured interview guide. And again, we sort of had this methodology for selecting counties. We didn't just sort of, you know, pick them. We had, um, again, I had lots of um, Excel spreadsheets and I had color coded everything. Um, and we really tried to do this by a couple of different indicators. First of all, as I mentioned, we wanted to pick communities that were um, various sizes. Um, so counties with larger populations closer to metropolitan areas and counties that were, you know, much more rural and smaller. We also wanted to look at available healthcare services. So one thing I haven't mentioned um, um, throughout this presentation is we've had some hospital closures in rural communities in our state. So we wanted to capture some of the communities that had hospitals versus some that didn't anymore, and if that made a difference. We also looked at county health indicators and picked some counties that were sort of on the worst end of that spectrum and some that were better. And then um, we tried to match counties again by sort of their racial and ethnic makeup. So we tried to look at, at counties on kind of both ends, counties that were high, had a high proportion of minority populations and counties that had a high proportion of, of uh, majority or white populations typically. 
Um, and we, we wanted to get non-health leaders. Um, so this was a little bit different for me as I'm, I typically work with health care providers and health leaders. Um, we wanted to start with, with somebody that was completely outside of the healthcare system. And so the literature actually shows that, um, and some of the work that some of my colleagues have done has showed that librarians and library directors were actually a really um, excellent resource in rural communities and would be a, a place that we could start for, um, for recruiting leaders to interview. And so that's what we did. One of the stories that I like to tell when I give this presentation is that, um, and, and this was a good learning lesson for me, but about halfway through my recruitment period last fall, um, I had been trying to get a hold of one of the library directors in particular, and I just was struggling to, her voicemail box was always full of her emails. You know, she didn't get emails from me. They kept bouncing back. It was just, and I had asked one of my colleagues in her county, you know, does this person exist? Because I thought, well, that's possible. Maybe she's, you know, she's gone on to a new job and she's not the right person. No, no, she's there. Keep calling her. So I finally get a hold of her and she tells me the story about how she's the current chairperson of the state library directors association who knew there was such a thing um, but there is <laughs> and that she had heard about me and she knew what i was doing and that um apparently that all the library directors had been on a listserv and i had been going out at this point and starting to do interviews and the few that had you know willingly agreed to let me come talk to them um were fortunately posting very good reviews of that <laughs> process which helped with the recruitment of oh some additional gosh. um library directors but that just goes to show you, you know, even when you don't necessarily, um, you know, know about things, they were, they were definitely talking about me and trying to figure out what I was doing and why was, you know, why was this girl from Columbia out talking to all of us about healthcare in our communities? What is this about? You know, is this a fraud? Is this, you know, so oh, wow. very important to make sure that you're, um, <laughs> that you're, you're being consistent with your, your messaging. Um, but that did, you know, wind up working pretty well. We, we actually had a few counties that we targeted that I, I never did get to. And part of that was I was recruiting between sort of the first of November and the kind of first to middle of January. That's a busy time of year for anybody. Um, and then particularly, you know, you have state employees in a lot of these places are taking time off, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, so there were a few counties we didn't get to, but we did most of the counties. I did um, nine counties total for these interviews. And I did initially contact the library director, although that wasn't who I always interviewed. Um, I interviewed a couple of library staff and board members in places when that library director felt like that those people had better, um, a better perception of the community and could inform me better in terms of what I was looking for. Um, and then whoever the first person was that I interviewed, I asked them to refer me to a faith leader. So sort of a snowball, um, you know, who did they think would be, you know, based on the questions I asked, who would be a good faith leader to talk to in that community. And so they often referred me there. In a couple instances, they referred me to um, a nonprofit in their community as well, that they thought that that leader was a very informed leader. And so I should also talk to them. So I did talk to, I did a couple of extra interviews in uh, some of the counties to include those folks as well. So, um, and again, we used, um, so once the, the individuals were recruited, we used an interview guide, um, those were all, recorded um, and tra transcribed. We also then did a full analysis on those interviews. Um, and then um, this actually was a project that I did for um, an independent study here at the university. So the IRB approved the project um, as exempt research. So, so we did all the, the uh, necessary behind the scenes work to ensure that the um, results that we achieved were, were of the utmost um, integrity and value. So I list the results here. Um, these were, again, we use these to help us kind of paint a picture. And I, I just have given you the very basic overview um, themes that we, we found. But again, we use these results to help us paint the picture of what, what did communities, um, how did they perceive health? And then, you know, how did the organization of, of healthcare services and other services in their communities contribute to health? So, so we found out a lot about, you know, how they felt about health, um, how, you know, how they saw health um, being structured in their community and, and their perceptions of, of that. And we learned a lot about the communities themselves, which was very helpful to this process. So they talked a lot about the, the other leaders in the community, a lot about the culture of the community and, and those, um, those types of things, which again, provided a lot of, of helpful context. So this was sort of the overall um, um, lessons that we learned and, and part of, of 
how these interviews were used. So, so one of the things that was a big um, uh, theme that we that we talked about with the leaders was how they really felt like health was sort of an individual mission, that it was really up to the individual and the way that they took care of themselves. That was really what health meant, that it was was all about that person. Um, but interestingly enough, it wasn't just about that person's physical health. It was also about their um, their mental health and their spiritual health. And it was very much a, a mind, body, soul was one of the descriptors that people use. So it was really a, a multifaceted approach to what health was for for individuals, but again, it was a very individually focused um, uh, thing, and that's important when you think about providing healthcare services or structuring programs. You want to make sure that you're you're focusing it then on the appropriate population. Um, again, probably not surprisingly, but a lot of the community factors um, really did contribute to overall health outcomes. Um, you know, we we talked a lot about. Um, there weren't specific questions about this, but we wound up talking a lot in a lot of these interviews about the availability of parks or gyms or a YMCA and, and I should say the lack of availability. Um, and then, you know, grocery stores. That was something that I think a lot of um, a lot of folks mentioned just that even if they had a grocery store, they didn't like it. And it was there was only really one place to shop. Um, and farmers markets were helpful, but again, this was in the kind of fall time of year and they had mostly all closed in a lot of these communities and so um, so those kinds of built environmental features that were um, contributing to health behaviors and people's ability to access healthy um, foods and, and active living resources um, were a big barrier to, um, to individuals. And then another interesting thing that we learned here was that um, a lot of the leaders felt like that there was a lot going on in each of the communities that there were many Healthcare services. There were many um, social services and things that were available, but that people in the community generally didn't participate in these things, and they had various reasons why they they felt that was so. And so we use a lot of that information, um, and we we used all of this, by the way, and, and presented this information back to the um, larger task force stakeholder group to really help inform their thought process as we developed recommendations. These were again some of my conclusions around that process and, and really um, pinpointed some of the areas where we might focus our work. One of the things is um, they felt like with low community engagement, you know, really that could help, um, that could be mitigated by the use of, of extenders such as community health workers and community paramedic patient navigators, people that are from the community who really can help bridge that um, gap towards the resources that are available. Um, and again, and you know, really helping to identify how how the community itself and the the community makeup, the lack of jobs, the lack of opportunities, how that contributes to health was was something that was um, and and I'll, when I get to the community listening sessions piece in a minute, that was really informative to a lot of those those folks to really have that conversation at a broader level. Um, people really engaged in that, and they really understood um, from a very um, basic level how all of these things fit together. I think, you know, even more so than I think, you know, not to um, not to criticize um, any of our academic efforts in this area, but um, but people in, intrinsically understand all of this. It's not something that you have to to explain necessarily. And in fact, they welcome the idea of talking about all these things in the same breath in the same conversation. So. So again, we um, we used this information. We took it back to the task force, um, and so then um, by about this was about February timeframe, we had some recommendations, and so we had worked with the task force to come up with some topic areas and some recommendations in each of those topic areas, and we literally physically took those recommendations out to the communities and we presented those and we asked them a few questions. Okay. Which of these recommendations, which of these things that we're proposing do you need in your community? That to me was the funniest question. You had to ask it because you wanted to make sure, you know, you needed sort of a checking mechanism. Um, but it was pretty funny because pretty much all the time everybody was like, yes, we need all these things. Like, why would you ask us for this? Yeah. So, so we, um, okay, so, so we had these lists of recommendations. So, so then we asked them to go through sort of a prioritization process. So, um, so we had a lot of different things listed under each topic area. Okay, which of these are most important? Um, which which need to be addressed first? And then we also asked for the community feedback on what was missing. Were there things that we didn't include that we should have in the in the 
process and the recommendations. So these were the things, and I haven't introduced this yet to you all, but there were five topic areas that recommendations were proposed in, and they're listed here. So one of the topic areas is housing. When this was, um, when the communities discussed these recommendations, they thought affordability um, and safety of housing were most important out of all the various um, housing needs that exist. When we talked about education, they talked about how the vocational programs in their communities and that availability um, as well as 3 and 4K were, were really important priorities for their communities. And I, I would like to point this out about the 3K and 4K because I think this was really important. The recommendation that we proposed to the community was that, you know, just for a blanket, we would have 3K and 4K for children. Um, the communities came back and, and resoundingly said, that's fantastic, but if it's not all day and it's not for all children, it doesn't nobody any good because then they're having, you know, parents are having to shuffle their children around. They're having to find other places to send them, take care of them during the day. If it's not all day, it's just not worth it. People are just going to continue to send their children to their grandmama's house or wherever. So, um, so that was something that we did change in the final draft of the recommendations and, and really use the community input there very directly. It's a very concrete example, which is why I like to, um, to bring that up. Um, when we talked about access to health care, which is another topic area, um, the, the issue of payment, of course, is very important for rural communities where we have high uninsurance rates often. Um, recruitment and retention of health professionals in the communities, as well as access to drug treatment. That was a big topic that, um, that community members keyed in on. And again, these were, when I talk about these sessions, these were groups of people. So these were people that were, that were coming to consensus together and we were facilitating a discussion around these topics. So. Um, so these were, so this was a consensus building exercise. Um, when we talked about economic development, more jobs, um, more industry were, were top priorities as well as a sort of active and diverse economic development um, method in the communities. And then we sort of had this, um, we had this group of recommendations that were um, affectionately called KALE, um, Community <laughs> Assets, Leadership and Engagement. And here, these were these were things around rural leadership, rural leaders, rural leadership, um, uh, the availability of grant resources, and just resources in general, knowledge of resources. And so, those were all things that were highlighted as priorities for communities. What was missing? Um, again, no surprise to us, transportation was hugely important, and that was something that. Um, in the end, we did not address through a recommendation, um, and I'll talk about that more in just a second. But um, but these were other things that weren't specifically um, pointed out in the recommendations, but it felt like were very important to their communities. And we did go back and incorporate some of this information into the final recommendations. I think again, you know, here here again lies the balance of having the task force group of community leaders and then having the rural community folks and trying to to bridge the opinions of those two groups and really figure out where the area, you know. Where's that, that place in the middle where, you know, it's both a need that the community will support and get behind as well as the politicians and the policymakers and the funders are all, you know, very willing to support um, because of their priorities. And so, you know, you would, you would hope that those are the same, but they aren't always. So we had to think about all those things when we brought all this information back together. Um, but we did include a lot of, of these things in a very high level way into the recommendations that were put forth. And then... Um, a lot of these, and I'll use childcare as a good example. So, so the recommendation, and I'm um, actually can I borrow this for a second? Sure. So, there's a recommendation under economic development, which is number um, seven, actually. So, the recommendation, as it reads, um, I guess as it as it read in the initial um, work that we proposed to the community, said ensure a diverse and well-trained workforce is that actively matched with public, private, and entrepreneurial job opportunities. It ended there. And so when we got feedback about things like childcare and resources for drug offenders, those are barriers to employment for a lot of people. And so we added that last part about removing barriers to employment. Oh, and in the process that we're going through now, where we're engaging further stakeholders, that will be one of the things that childcare will fall under um, this recommendation as an action step. That will be one of the things that we will put action behind and, and really work to figure out so that that's something that um, we can help to remove as a barrier to employment. So that's one way of how we use that um, process. 
Um, and then accounting for regional differences, I'll just say really quickly, that was something that um, we um, wanted to make sure that um, we heard different things in different parts of the state. Again, I said there's a lot of diversity in our rural communities. You know, our coastal areas um, that have been impacted the last few years by lots of flooding and lots of, um, you know, issues from hurricanes and all those terrible natural disasters we've had. Um, housing is a much, much bigger issue right now in our coastal rural communities than it is in other parts of the state because of those reasons. And there's a lot of mold issues that are kind of ongoing in those areas. And it's something that I think as we go forward, we have to make sure we're kind of accounting for as we put action steps to these recommendations. We also made sure we collected some of the success stories. So people were very, um, uh, very forthcoming and, and willing to talk about the good things happening in their communities, which is great. That's part of what I love about my job is getting to go out and hear all these good things and being able to promote those. And so we really tried to collect those as much as possible as well. So this slide um, you probably will have access to, we won't go into this, but this is a link to the recommendations and there's a video here that um, that is um, reviews a little bit of our, our press conference that we had on the third to release the recommendations. But again, we had 15 recommendations that sort of came out of this long process of the task force, you know, using the community input, using the FE data to kind of come to these conclusions. And so now we have this document that has these recommendations and we have to, um, we have to make sure that those are operationalized now. So that's what we're doing. We um, we actually, so um, so this is, I can actually share our, our full on plan that we have for this now. We just have gotten that kind of um, outlined firmly. We're actually taking those 15 recommendations and we've created a survey for stakeholders. So, um, and when I say stakeholders this time, I mean organizations and groups that are actively working on these various recommendations. So the, the recommendations around education, we're going to send out and target to you know different schools, principals, superintendents, school advocacy organizations, anybody that's in an education sector, we are going to try to target the survey to. And what we're asking in the survey is, are you working on these things? Um, if so, tell us what you're doing. If not, tell us who we need to call. So we are trying to get kind of a comprehensive scan now of kind of the activity in the state on each of these different um, recommendations and topic areas. So that's actually going out, um, I hope, by Friday. <laughs> um, and so we're going to be doing that for about the next few three to four weeks to get that data back and collect that use the information that we already kind of have, um, again, child care being that example, we already kind of have some of that information that we can plug into um, action steps. And we're going to go through and draft action steps as kind of a, a steering committee slash working group of willing individuals to um, to draft, draft those action steps. If we get to a place where we don't have enough input in one of the areas, so maybe we don't have enough information about um, the, uh, let's just say, housing group, then we'll, uh, in, in July, we'll bring together those housing um, stakeholders and we'll have a meeting um, of minds to help kind of tease out what those action steps should be. So once all of that's done and we have a pretty good look at um, what the action steps are going to be, and we have a, a pretty solid draft, we're going to have that out for public comment. And that's another way to sort of get community feedback. And again, because a lot of this work impacts rural communities, we want to make sure that that, you know, gets out to the rural communities, that they have the opportunity to comment on these action steps and do they make sense and is this the way that we should move forward. So, um, so that's kind of going to be going on all summer and our goal is to sort of have all of that wrapped up by like the 1st of September so we can get ready to, to do everything that needs to be done to kind of fully put this in a publishable format. So um, this slide just talks a little bit more about kind of the time frame that we're looking at. Um, you know, I've sort of talked through the process that we're looking at, but again, continuously and you know, iteratively engaging stakeholders throughout the summer to really get to um, the crux of these these action steps and action steps that are measurable. So the other piece of this is that we want to make sure that we're able to sort of track over time how we're doing on on these these different areas. I said we come back to transportation, so I wanted to mention that for a minute. Um, we had the 15 recommendations, and then for those of you that have the um, are looking at the, um, the roadmap, it has a list of about nine different things at the top of the recommendations that are called, we, we called them cross-cutting issues. So these were things that we saw 
through either the community input or through some of the quantitative data that we said, these are really important issues. They cover all of these topics, but they're also not things that are solvable in the next three to five years. So we want to highlight how important they are and we want to address them in some way whenever possible, but it's not something that we felt like in the initial phase of this process and this plan that we could really put forth recommendations on. So, um, so that was one of the ways that we addressed some of that, that feedback that we got as well. So a couple of things I want to say just kind of in closing here. Um, so I have thought a lot about the topic and the, the title, I guess, of this course, which is um, assessments and, and how they relate to healthcare delivery. So, um, so really, you know, I haven't talked a ton about healthcare delivery, but there, there is a lot of implications for rural communities. And I think part of what is um, maybe inherent in this that I haven't said is that the healthcare delivery system in rural communities really is the community because the hospital or the health system in those communities or the you know very large federally qualified health center is the largest employer oftentimes then that really is where a lot of people work a lot of people's families are you know patients i mean it's really the threat of um, a lot of rural communities so so by thinking about all these various factors you really are looking at how that's going to impact the delivery of healthcare services there there were three specific recommendations though regarding access to care and those will be certainly um, impactful in that in that area. Um, one of the things we heard over and over from the task force and Jane and I don't know if you want to speak to this in a minute but there was a lot of um, just increased awareness and networking among both the task force providers and then the community um, folks as well. As I mentioned, you know these discussions when we got into those larger groups at the community level, these discussions really resonated with people and you had the health people and the housing people and the, you know, the mayor and the, we had a chamber of commerce person at one meeting, you know, these various people that don't necessarily all sit in the same room at the same table, but they have all the same problems. And I think this was very eye opening for a lot of people to really, you know, there was like, you know, strength in numbers sort of thing happening and, and people really felt like they had more people to help them and they didn't feel quite as isolated. Um, I think there's a lot of direct and indirect both policy and funding implications. I think as you as you think about, um, especially in the broad context of population health in the world that we're living in with how um, CMS and other healthcare payers are looking to, to restructure payments to providers based on risk or based on um, the health of populations and how well they're able to manage that. There's a lot of implication there with how you address communities as a whole and improve the health of the community to um, to that end. I made this question about what is Mission Creek, or I, I put this here. This was something that we heard as sort of a negative feedback from some of the stakeholders. Um, actually, throughout the process, we're still hearing that some, and I think it's um, I think it's important to highlight that that part of this was was us as a state office of rural health shining a light on some of these issues. It's not up to us to necessarily go out and become experts in housing. We're never gonna be experts in housing, nor do we want to be. Um, but we, we know that housing and, and affordable quality housing is important for health outcomes. And so it's our job to make sure that we're saying to people, hey, we really need to work on housing because that ultimately is gonna impact people's health. So I, I spoke with a colleague about this, um, at a national conference a few weeks ago and he has he's in an office with a staff of like two and he said i just don't see how you guys did all this work and i said i said i get that i said but part of what you can do is as you're going out meeting with different community members and community leaders in your work anyway shine a light on all these things you have to continuously just reinforce and inform people about these various factors that are important to um to rural health outcomes um this is just my i also like to provide a lot of editorial comments to um, to things, and so these were my personal kind of reflections. Um, it was really hard from a community engagement standpoint. I mentioned that I typically work with healthcare providers and health providers and health oriented folks in rural communities. My um, my ability to really engage with these non health leaders was more difficult than I thought it would be, and I really had to rely a lot on my per personal and professional networks in these areas to really help me connect with those a lot of times. Like I said, I had pinpointed, you know, some individuals in different counties and yet I still had to get, you know, call somebody I knew to call them to get them to call me. So, I mean, you sort of had to really be creative and 
um, really be flexible with um, a lot of that recruitment um, of community members. Um, a lot of flexibility was involved, like I said, when we, especially when we got to the larger group settings, Cassie and I, during the month of March, basically went and talked to anybody who would talk to us. So, you know, that meant, you know, I was in um, a big town hall one night, and then the very next night I went to church, you know, in another town, and then, you know, we were just sort of going wherever we had to and doing whichever approach. Um, the one, I, one of my favorite ones was I went to a, a church that um, the pastor had set everything up for me to come, and then it turns out he couldn't be there at the last minute, and so um, the woman, when I showed up, said, how long do you need? And I said, well, I'd really like 45 minutes. It takes about that long to sort of go through all this. And she goes, can you do it in 20? I was like, well, sure. You know, I, I will do my best. And I wound up doing it about 15 because I was just so like terrified. I was like, I just want to, you know, I want to respect your time and you guys all want to go home. And so um, being really flexible was important. Um, the required resource intensity, I think, is important just in doing qualitative work. Kelly and I were talking about that before we got started, about how long that takes and how you always underestimate how long that's going to take, um, particularly when you're trying to, to respect the, the people's stories and the input that you're getting from communities. That's really important to me as a, as a person and as a researcher and as a public health professional. Um, but that takes a lot of time, and I think we have to always respect that. And then again, being transparent between different conversations and different um, groups that you're talking with. I mean, people really do talk to each other and really making sure that you're being um, forthcoming about what you're what you're up to and why you're doing it and, and who you're talking to and who you're giving that information to. That's all very, very important for um, for community members to understand. And I think that is it. So that's my contact information. I'm happy if there are questions or thoughts that folks have. And we'll now. make the slides uh, me available for everybody. Anything that um, I can help with, I'm happy to. So. Oh, great question. Well, it's, um, oh, so she says. That is a good question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer that maybe in two ways. Um, so, in general, yes, I think that um, especially, you know, one of the things that we um, that we talked a lot about in that social work course that I mentioned is, you know, do you do community engagement for, about, or with communities? And I think the programs that I've been involved with where I've done that with communities, they certainly take ownership and figure out ways to sustain it. I've seen that in my personal experience, just helping, helping communities develop programs that are of interest and of need to them. It's a little bit early to tell, I think, with this effort. Um, I definitely think, um, so I mentioned that we had an event at the State House to release the recommendations in May, and we had done the um, listening session, sessions in March, and all of those people we invited to be a part of that release. And I was amazed. First of all, we had a nominal turnout, but I was amazed to see some of the people from those listening sessions at the State House for wow. that, um, that event. I mean, it really was touching me because it said to me wow. that people were really excited about this and they were really, um, you know, invested in it and really wanted to make sure that they were a part of it. So, um, so yeah, I, I definitely think Would you think consider there's, the there's Office of Rural that, Health to be a backbone organization it. in this case? That's a good question, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for lack of a better term yeah lack of a better term you know we may but we may not be the the you know long term one i mean right, i think certainly right. we were the initiator of initial initial backbone organization but um you know but but our hope is that you know we really just felt like it was important to you know, create this and get the right, process right. going. And, you know, we'll we'll see kind of where it goes from here. Um, but great, I'm glad I answered your question. So it was great speaking with you all. I'm happy oh, again. You, so you guys bad. have other questions? Um, please email me. Uh, 